Father of lights. You know, what a wonderful Father we have. I want you to open your Bibles, if you would, to the book of James. Book of James, verse 1. Very important that you rightly divide the Word of God, know who it's written to, and what it pertains to. Verse 1 reads, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. In other words, it's written to those that have eyes to see, ears to hear, and to understand the light. And the light is that word that enlightens you, a word that gives you strength. And don't ever underestimate your father. He's able to take care of you. When, you're re- when you need rewarding and when you deserve it, not until, absolutely not until, but as long as you deserve it, he's going to heap it on you if you're doing his work and if you're pleasing unto him. Verse 17 for the subject. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. This has to do with celestial things. That is to say, the sundial, the the shadow shadow changes. And we have eclipses because one planet or moon or sun gets in the way of the other. But never with God. God. He's always a bright light right on to your being. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. And that light is there for protection, for guidance, to lead you, and to strengthen you in what? His Word. All promises are fulfilled in His Word, whereby uh, if, if you meet the conditions thereof, they're yours. But you have to talk to him about it. You have to remind him of that promise because he's not going to remind, he's not going to remind you of it. But well, why wouldn't he do that? Because he wants to know you've studied the word, his word. Otherwise you're lacking and you can do without. Okay. And that's just the way it is. All good things come from him. A constant light, never wavering never changing. And the variableness is to the fact that he doesn't play favorites. He goes by fact. Well, what kind of facts? Verse 18. Of his will, will, of his will, of his own will begat he us with the word of truth. How did he begat you? With the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. You should be a blessing to other people. You should have that word where it builds you up, gives you stability, that people can count on you for an answer in bad times, in hard times even, that God is still on the throne. We still have the victory big time. Okay. It's the enemy that falls. But that, that being, and, and you were begat. You're his. As it's written in Isaiah chapter 18 verse 4, all souls belong to God. Why? He's our father. He created us. Why? Because he wanted someone just like you. Verse 19. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. To hear what? Hear the word of God. Man's word doesn't amount to that much. It's God's word, chapter by chapter and verse by verse, that counts, that matures, that leads, guides, and directs, that will bring you that light from heaven, from above, from your heavenly Father who begat you. Your family, whether you like it or not, and don't ever drift away from that. For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. Uh, Anger brings about controversy always. Doubts bring about controversy. Man is just full of them. And man likes to lay them on you. 
Stick with God's Word. All good gifts come from above. Don't expect too many here on earth that God is not connected with in rewarding you for good things and your very love and life itself. Verse 21, Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity, that's to say, uh, over uh, uh, anxiety of uh, overflowing of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save your souls. What is engrafted enters into your mind, into your being. What word? The word of God. The word that begets you. The word that brings the light and comes with the light. That makes you a blessing to other people, or it should. And when you are a doer of that word which is brought forth by the light, our Father of lights, which is to say, of course, our Heavenly Father. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. Nothing, nothing will ever get between you and He to to dissuade that light. It's there for you. At any time you need it, even as it's written, your angel has the face of God any time you're in trouble, if you're one of God's elect. And that's who this is written to, those twelve scattered abroad. You're scattered. Verse 22, But be ye doers, this is important, be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. You can do that. Well, I just want to educate myself in the word. Well, you got to be doing a little of it. You know, put it to practice. Share it. What good is it if only you have it? You know, I, I could say... All the knowledge that I've attained from 50 years of teaching and studying the languages, and if I kept it all bottled up right here, what good would it do the world? What good would it do God's children? It wouldn't do them any good at all. Neither would it you. If the knowledge and truth that you gain from that light, if you dim it, turn it off, if you hide it in your own soul, then it's wasted. Basically, it's not, you got to be a doer and a hearer. You have to put it to practice. Verse 23, for if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. It's like you going up and looking in the mirror and giving yourself a big smile. You know, hi there. You know, boy, there you are, just big as life. You know, but what happens when you walk away? There's nothing there. That's what he's saying. You're like a man looking in a mirror. The minute you walk away, you're nothing. You leave nothing there. And a man that just hears and doesn't do, he's nothing. Just a mirror. And he's gone. So take that light with you. That's what he's talking about. Let that light shine. Let that light, I mean, protect your credibility. But there are people hurting in this world that sooner or later are going to come to you and say, I wonder why this or that. You tell them. God will give you intuitively the right answer at that moment if you will allow that light to work in your life, the Holy Spirit. He'll touch you. And you'll be a blessing to that person. That's why Christianity is such a wonderful thing. It lifts up. It doesn't tear down. Man's arguing and controversy always tears down. It will cause trouble in your family. It will have your family arguing over nothing. When you have that beautiful light coming down from our Heavenly Father to enlighten not only you, but those around you. But here, here he looks into that uh, mirror, and um, and we find it um, in verse twenty four. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was, loses the picture, can't remember twenty five to complete. 
But whosoever looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. You want to know what brings blessings? Do it. Hear the word and share. That doesn't mean you're supposed to stand on every street corner and start preaching. Okay. There's enough trouble in life whereby you are a first fruit. Someone that is to give a good word. It may be just a smile. You know, it makes a big difference when somebody's hurting. But of understanding whereby they see that light in you that reflects from the Father of lights, our Heavenly Father. How precious it is to be a servant of the living God. Let's go, if we may, to Matthew chapter 5. Verse 13, let's pick it up there, if we may. Ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt hath lost his savor, that's flavor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. You know, salt is a good thing. You know, our human bodies, though a lot of doctors say you got to quit salt, you, you would die if you did, totally. We have to have salt to maintain ourselves. If you've ever been in the desert as I have and saw somebody salted, that means void of salt. They've sweated out. They're almost a dead man. So uh, salt is precious, but if you if it doesn't have its salt, it's worthless. And a Christian without the light, it's the same thing. What good are they? Good to be cast out into the street. That's what. Verse 14, ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. If you truly reflect that Holy Spirit, if the very mirror of your being reflects that light, it cannot be hid. You cannot hide the Holy Spirit that dwells within someone. It is obvious to those around you. And they are drawn to it if they hurt, if they need answers. Why? They, because of His love. All good gifts come from our Father above. Verse 15, Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but a, on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Your whole family needs it. It lights the whole house. You don't... Hide it away. When you're given a truth by God, don't hold that in your little hand and say, oh, he gave that just to me. That'll be the last thing he'll ever give you if you don't share it. You know, when you're studying and you find a beautiful, wonderful truth, you'd better share it or God will cut you off. You're, the, you're, you're seeing into the very depth of God's word will end if you try to keep those things to yourself, to hide them within, when you're supposed to reflect that light, to be a blessing to others, not argumentative and not judgmental, but simply a light that brightens, that brings forth the truth. Verse 16, Let your light so shine before me and that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Always giving our Heavenly Father that credit that all good gifts come from above. And when you reflect that light, 17, and he continues, then think not, the teachings of Christ, think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. And he does. He is that light that was sent to us. That word that is the light became flesh and walked among us. Why? Giving us the example of how we should walk, how we should uh, uh, bring forth the conflict between ourselves and Satan. 
You know, when you're one of God's elect, you better get set for it. Satan's got your number. He wants to deceive you and lead you away. And sometimes people follow that path, not recognizing that, because he's the false light, and you want no part of that light that is false. Let's go to the book of Acts, if we may. Acts chapter 12. How well that God knows, especially with Passover coming up and with the times of um, the Feast of the Unleavened Bread when people are in trouble, how God can intercede. And not only can God intercede, but God does intercede. We have we're we're at um, we're at the feast of the unleavened bread at the beginning of this chapter, uh, chapter twelve of uh, of the book of Acts, and they've just murdered James, the brother of John, and boy the head leaders of the Jews they they were they were happy, they loved it, so let's pick it up if we may chapter twelve verse one the great book of Acts how God's light directs and helps those that actually do the work. I say do the work of Almighty God. Now about the time, about that time, Herod, the king, stretched forth his hand to vex certain of the church, trying to make a name for himself, show his power and his authority. Okay. And he killed James, the brother of John, with a sword. Verse 3. And because he saw it pleased the Jews, that's to say the leaders there, Kenites, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Then were the days of unleavened bread. It was a feast day, and and he couldn't, too late then to kill Peter. But he was going to. In other words, Peter's life, as far as anyone was concerned, was over. Herod was going to see to it. But you see... Your father had other plans. Almighty God is on the throne. Things happen as he wants it to, not as some man does. Not as some government might want it to happen, as Herod did. But as God would have it happen. Verse 4. And when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four quatrains, which is to say 16 guards, okay, of soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. It's going to kill him. Now, this word Easter in the Greek is passel, which is Passover. So you can just correct that in your Bible. It's a mistake. The word Easter is not in the manuscripts. Ishtar is a pagan holiday, and unfortunately, some people that like to build crowds with something other than the true light uh, cheat sometimes. Verse 5, Peter, therefore, was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. I mean, he was he was there, that old fisherman of... Uh, What a man of love he was to the church, leading it, guiding it, directing it, helping them. Herod's going to kill him. Verse 6, And when Herod would have brought him forth, the same night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers. He's chained to them, bound with two chains. And the keepers before the door kept the prison. I mean, he was locked tighter than you could ever wish. Seven, listen carefully. And behold, the angel of the Lord. That's always the presence of Almighty God. That is the Holy Spirit de facto in person. The angel of the Lord came upon him and a light. There is that light from above. Shine in the prison, and he smote Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise up quickly. And his chains fell off from his hands. Your father is able. You might say, well, I didn't know he would do it. When 
You're delivered before the false Messiah. Your father will do things that will amaze you for sure if you're not set for it. Your father's on the throne. The light comes from him. He's not going to let anything get between you and that light as long as you believe and are a doer of that word. Those chains fell away. Verse 8, And the angel said unto him, Gird thyself, and bind on thy sandals. And so he did. And he saith unto him, Cast thy garment about thee, and follow me. What is it you're going to put on? When you follow him, what do you put on? You put on the gospel armor, and you snug it up right real good, and you be ready. Okay. Why? You're one of the first fruits. He says it. If you follow it, then that is truth. And with that gospel armor on and in place, you have that direct tie to Almighty God as he watches over. Verse 9, And he went out and followed him, and was not that it was true which was done by the angel, but thought he saw a vision. He didn't know if he was dreaming, awake, or what. I mean, things were happening so fast. And it seemed so so wonderful. I mean, he, he was about to be killed with a sword or some way. Murdered. And God delivered him. And he's trying to make up his mind. Uh, is, was, did I dream this or is it real? Ten, and when they were past the first and the second ward, those old gates just swinging open. They came into the iron gate that leadeth into the city, main one, which opened to them of its own accord. And they went out and passed on through one street, and forthwith the angel departed from him. Not the light, but that presence, that power and octane of presence of Almighty God left him at that time. Why? He can cut it. God doesn't have to knit wet nurse those that are first fruits. They pretty well know how to take care of themselves, but when they need that help, God is always there. The light of our Heavenly Father is always there. Nothing, nothing in this world can penetrate, get in the way, shadow, or change that light that comes from Him that strengthens, that guides. And Peter was set free. And when Peter was come to himself, got it figured out. He said, Now I know of a surety that the Lord has sent His angel and hath delivered me out of the hand of Herod and from all the expectations of the people of the Jews. They wouldn't see me dead, and this spoiled the party for them. And when he had considered the thing, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together praying. Mark John was just a teenager, but his mother provided the house for many of these gatherings. That's why Mark John could write the book of Mark, because he had firsthand witness, though he was not a disciple. 13, and as Peter knocked at the door of the gate, a damsel came to hearken named Rhoda. That's Rose. Okay. Rose came to the door. And when he, she knew Peter's voice, she opened not the gate for, for gladness, but ran in and told how Peter stood before the gate. Peter's there. He's out there. Let him in, for heaven's sakes. Okay. Let get him off the street. Yeah. And they saw, and they said unto her, Thou art mad. But she constantly affirmed that it was even so. Then they said, It is his angel. He's, they've already done him in, and his angel is coming to visit us now. But Peter continued knocking, and when they had opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. You see, that light is always going to have its way. And when it comes to the Feast of Unleavened Bread, when it comes to Passover, what did God promise coming out the gate about Passover? Anoint yourself and the death angels got to pass over your house. Got to pass over you. Don't you believe it? 
Don't you understand Passover? Do you understand the light? Do you understand your Father? He's not just a bunch of words. He is your Heavenly Father. But you want to always remember there is a controversy in this world and there is also a false light. Don't be deceived. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Paul doing some teaching here, okay? And Paul says in verse 1, Would to God you could bear with me a little in my folly and indeed bear with me. What, what he's saying here, it loses a little in the translation. I want to really open my heart up to you. I, I, I want you to know what's in my heart. I want you to know what I'm worried about, concerned about. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. I don't want you deceived by any other Christ. There's only one way you can participate in the marriage, and that is to be a spiritual virgin for Christ. Verse 3, But I fear, lest by any means as the serpent beguiled, thus seduced, holy, ekpatio in the Greek, Eve, through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Christ's teaching is so simple a child can understand it. But man, many times they'll have initials behind their name. They like to stir with a big stick. Okay, Doctors of this and doctors of that and a bachelor's degree in this and... Um, B, B, and B, D, and B, S. Okay, a lot of it. Okay. And they can stir it up till you can't see the bottom. That's what he's talking about here. For if he that cometh preaches another Jesus. Do you understand there's only one? But a lot of people teach another one. There's only one. Whom we have not preached. Or if you receive another spirit which you have not received, or another gospel which you have not accepted, you might well bear with him. This really loses it in the, in the translation. It says, you swallow it. You seem gullible. You like to hear it. But I thought it was some new religion. There's only one Jesus. There's only one light. The light of our Father that is good that brings good blessings. Now, there's a false one, and it will lead you down Primrose Lane. He said, it just seems like you love to hear these super preachers. Verse 5, For I suppose I was not a whit behind the very chiefest apostles. I think I know the word about as well as anybody, Paul says. But though I be rude in speech, yet not in knowledge, but we have been thoroughly made manifest among you in all things. We've proved it over and over and over through the Word of God. There's no excuse. <clears throat> Excuse me. Have I committed an offense in abasing myself that you might be exalted because I have preached to you the gospel of God freely? <clears throat> Excuse me. That means without any compensation. Eight, I robbed other churches, taking wages of them to do you service. Nine, and when I was present with you and wanted, when I, when I was hungry, I was chargeable to no man for that which was lacking to me, the brethren which came from Macedonia supplied, and in all things I have kept myself. He was a tent maker and a good one. They always hired him wherever he went. From being burdensome unto you, and so will I keep myself. That's the way I want it. That's the way it's going to stay. But don't let that throw you off limits that what I had to say, just because it was free to you, it was worthless. It's the word of God. And the truth of Christ is in me. No man shall stop me of this boasting in the regions of Achaia. Achaia means trouble. In this trouble, wherever there is trouble, Nothing is going to stop me from teaching the real Word of God as it is. It may sound a little crude, and it may be direct, and it may sound bold. 
but I'm going to teach it exactly as it's written with no apology. And that's the way Paul was. 11, wherefore, because I love you not, God knoweth. God knows what? Knows I do. He does love them. But what I do, that I will do, that I may cut off occasion from them which desire occasion, and wherein they glory, they may be found even as we. I'm going to, I can pull the rug out from under them any time I want to with truth. And that's the way it is. There's only one Christ. This is why we came here, and this is the warning. 13, for such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming. The word in the Greek is disguising. Disguising themselves into the apostles of Christ. They come in the name of Jesus. This is why Jesus told you in Mark 13, many are going to come in my name, don't let them deceive you. That doesn't mean they're teaching God's word chapter by chapter and verse by verse. 14, and no marvel. That's no great mystery. For Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. What light? The false light. Don't confuse the lights. That's why we came here. You have the true light. But there is also a false light. And Satan is disguised as that light. Hey, he can perform miracles as it, as it is written in Revelation chapter 13 that's going to awesome, be awesome to the world. And that light is going to shine. But it's not the light from above of which you are a part of. So never be deceived. There's only one Jesus. That's the true one. Don't let somebody give you a bill of goods by teaching a false one. And, and, and he continues on then in 15, Therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed or disguised as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. And so it is that our Father, utilizing the very Word itself, the light from above, warns you of the false light. Turn back now, if you would, to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Second Corinthians chapter four. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God under that light, the real true ministry. What? God's Word, chapter by chapter and verse by verse. Don't forget, what is it that begat you? What begat you? The Word of God. So don't be robbed. Don't let someone else give you something other than the Word of God. But if our gospel be hid... It is hid to them that are lost, that, um, that, that have veils over their face, that can't see truth, that can't see the light, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light, the what? The light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. If they would only listen if they would open their ears, but basically their spirits and their mind to hear the real truth of God and receive His blessings. Otherwise, you're kind of out in the cold because the God of this world, you know who He is? It's Satan. He's allowed that power and He will romp on you if you let Him. Big time. But you have power over Him. See that you use it. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. Really slaves, basically, to the word. For God, 
who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. That's that light. It's the light from above. It's the gift, the ministry, and how precious it is. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, even in the flesh, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. It always is. Never take credit for God's power, though he loans it to you. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. What does it take to shake you up? What does God have to do to get your attention? Well, things are sure going wrong. Well, look up and smile. Okay. Fix it. Do something. Do something right. Talk to your father. Look for an answer. Okay. Always Bearing about, bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body, that his resurrection guarantees that we have eternal life. For we which live are always delivered unto death from, for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. And it was, it was dangerous during Paul's time for a Christian to go out and really teach the word. You know something is kind of getting that way anymore. It truly is. So then death worketh in us, but life in you. It brings eternal life. We having the same spirit of faith, according as it is written, I believed and therefore I have spoken. We also believe and therefore speak. And so it is. Don't ever, ever apologize for the word of God. Don't ever, ever apologize for the true light the light that gives you eternal life. Knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also by Jesus and shall present us with you, with you all, so to speak, a family, the first fruits. For all things are for your sakes that the abundance of grace might through the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God. And so it is, my friends, that that light that comes from above comes from the Father of lights. That's your Heavenly Father, He that begat your soul. It is true that He reclaims you by the Word, but in the beginning He created your being because He wanted someone just like you. And that's why He puts the light there, that He can care for you, that He can take care of you, that he can watch over you. But whatever you do, he has warned you of the false light. See that you're not drawn to it because it's beginning to brighten every day. The God of this world is turning up the heat against Christianity. Christians are having a kind of a tough go, but nothing we can't handle. Okay, We take names, we kick dragon. Always will, always have. And the main thing is, is we grow faster than they do. Why? Because God is with us. God blesses us. God gives us that truth. And what a truth it is. A good truth shining from heaven, from the Father of lights, Almighty God himself. Heavenly Father, thank you, Father. Thank you for that light. Thank you, Father, for the begatting through the word, Father. Father, we just ask for the blessings upon these and let them be a blessing to all they come in contact with, never hiding their light under a a bushel, but reflecting that light where others can have that hope. In Jesus' precious name, amen, amen. The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the mark of the beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. 
Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of the mark of the beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. We, we don't judge as to whether they're forgivable or not. God, All God said is send them up here so I can judge them. Give them a trial. God may find them innocent. That is to say, innocent to the fact that maybe they deserve to be forgiven if they can convince God. But um, it is not um, unforgivable. That's left up to God to judge. That's why he said, bring them up here. I'll take care of it. And boy, does he. Many will still be tried. Virginia from North Carolina. Pastor, when we die, where do we go? Well, our flesh goes back to dust as from which it came. As as uh, we as we eat, eat food growing from the dirt, organic matter, uh, our bodies are basically formed from organic materials. Uh, but our spirit, which is the intellect of our soul, our very being, returns instantly to the Father that gave it. To be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord. Second Corinthians chapter five verse seven and eight. Uh, Gloria from Arkansas, Pastor Murray, please explain to me 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 10. Thank you. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter uh, uh, 11, verse 10 stipulates that a woman should always have be covered. But covered, this is where people lose if you're not careful. Covered how? With Christ. In other words, have be under Christ. Have Christ over their head. Why? Well, that verse 11 tells you, 10 rather tells you very clearly, because of what? Because of the angels. Why? Well, in the end, as it is written by Christ himself, again, I'll go back to Matthew 24. It's going to be like it was in the days of Noah. They're going to be giving and taking in marriage with what? The fallen angels. And a woman should, I mean, they're after women. They love them. That's why they left their first habitation and, and um, to, to seduce women if it is possible. That's why a woman wants Christ over her head, whereby she knows the fakes and, and has power in, as a Christian over them. They have to obey in Christ's name. And so that's why she must have Christ over her head. And uh, so it is. Why? Because Christians have power over evil spirits. They have to adhere to the name of Jesus Christ. William from Louisiana. I am interested in the order of events during the end times. Can you explain these, please? Well, that would take about five or six programs to give it all uh, laid out. But that's why God made it simple for you. There are six seals. We were talking about them earlier. Just start with the first and go all the way through, and you'll have it. If you want the exact chronological order as events transpire, though, you get it from the trumps. Well, what is a trump? That sound, that bugle for charge, action. So that's how it comes to pass chronologically is the way the trumps go. Uh, Rachel from California. Pastor Murray, I need to know why I feel like God doesn't hear me. Well, he always hears you. You know, it's written in the great book of Revelation that there is a big bottle there and it's filled with the prayers of the saints. He not only hears them, he saves them. And uh, they're, they're locked and loaded there. But uh, you see, when you say, when, when you say, I know why, I, can, I need to know why I feel like God doesn't hear me, do you know what that sounds like? Doubt? Like you're really doubting him? You can't do that. He's your father. He's the creator of your very being. 
He made your DNA, your fingerprints, different than any other human being because he wanted someone, uh, Rachel, just like you. And he, and he loves you. But he wants you to trust him, to love him. He will never leave you as it is written in Hebrews chapter 13. He will never forsake you. So don't doubt that. That's dangerous. Read it from Georgia. Pastor Murray, what is the chapter and verse that refers to the person that will not work, should not eat? Thank you. The person that will not work, this has nothing to do, number one, let me uh, illustrate to handicapped people. Handicapped people are to be cared for. But if a person is able-bodied, lazy, won't work, won't listen, a busybody, then in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 10, don't feed them. And many will say, well, that sounds cruel to me. No, it's not cruel at all. If, if uh, they have had enough times of warning given in love that they won't work, then when you don't feed them pretty soon, when they get hungry enough, they have the, uh, this beautiful, wonderful urge to work to get out there and hump it, get to it. And so that's why in tough love, you just don't feed them, and pretty soon they'll get out there and do for themselves. Again, I want to reillustrate, that has nothing whatsoever to do with handicapped persons. Linda from Wisconsin. Pastor Murray, I went back to my husband, whom I divorced seven years ago. He says, in God's eyes, we are still married. Is that true? I just love you, Pastor. Thank you so much. Well, we love you in return, and you're very welcome. Uh, probably in God's eyes that would be true, but let me warn you. When you go back to him, I don't know what kind of um, property settlement or whatever you may have agreed to in the divorce, but then now that you are back together and what you gain together, again, there would have to be you possibly, um, and I'm not sure what the Wisconsin law is. If there is, a, but um, it probably wouldn't hurt if you check that out. To what your legal ramifications are, and especially if you were childbearing age, it would have a great deal to do with that concerning Social Security. Even if a child were born to you, when you, the two of you are divorced. Um, as far as his Social Security is concerned. There there would be legal ramifications, and you need to think about it. James from Missouri. If there was no flesh in the first earth age, how did they leave footprints? Well, they, they, um, they were of a substance. Angel food will even keep a flesh body alive. And we were made in their exact image just the way they were only out of a different material and the material they're made of was mass certainly they were able to impregnate woman and naturally they would leave a footprint but uh, it is a different body than ours for certain we're of the dirt okay they're not uh, Marsha from Michigan I get confused when I read my Bible and the word Lord is mentioned. Whom are they speaking of, God or Jesus? Well, this is one of the reasons that I highly recommend the Companion Bible because you have an outline of every chapter and basically it gives you who the who's and, the, and so forth are. If you are in the Old Testament and the word Lord is all in the uppercase. Usually, in the Hebrew manuscripts, the word is Yahweh. Okay. But at the same time, in certain places, as Lord is mentioned, you have, it is from, I speak in the Hebrew, Adonai, or um, El Shaddai. And then in the New Testament, of course, uh, usually, Lord, after the birth, was Christ himself. But um, if you follow the subject in the article, you're, you're not going to go too far wrong. Okay. <clears throat> Let me set you at ease just a little bit. 
you know the lecture we were giving today? And I said, Emmanuel, you will call him, that is to say, God with us. They're the same. Let that set you at ease somewhat. Julie from Texas. Uh, praise God. Uh, let's see here. My, my sister said that when you marry, you are not to have anything to do with your family. We have always been close, and I know she is wrong, even though she says it is in the Bible. Please clarify this for us. Probably Genesis chapter 2, verse 24 has got her confused. It stipulates there that when, when one marries, they are to leave their parents, and the two of them become one. They start their own family. But uh, families are always very close. That's your protection, your strength. And certainly families should be together. And families should fellowship. That's your strength. Blood is thicker than water. And uh, but I, I would say probably Genesis two twenty four got her confused and has misinterpreted it. Uh, I could I could draw on one other thing. Even in the millennium in Ezekiel chapter forty four verses twenty through twenty five, family is still extremely important because they're ha- able to help each other. They are to have to do with each other. And then really, we're all the family of God. And that's what fellowship and to abide means. Um, Loretta from, um, I don't know where Loretta is, from Georgia. I have a question. Jesus is God's son. Does that mean mankind is Jesus' sister and brother? I know like I would like to know the answer to this question. Thank you and God bless you. Well we're, we're, we are all family and to uh, Jesus considered us family if you love him and if you follow him, we are family in the sense that we are children of God. Um, many people, uh, we'll come across the scripture, I believe it's in tomorrow's lecture, that's, or the next day, whichever, that uh, ye are gods. It means you belong to him, not that you are some god. We only have one god, and that's our father. But uh, uh, we all belong to him. We're all family. Not we're his children. That is family. Shelley from Alabama. I have one question. When you were talking about Gideon... This is, this is written to Pastor Dennis. I'll answer it for him. He said it'd be okay. All right. Uh, I have one question. When you were talking about Gideon asking for a sign by putting out a fleece two times to the Lord, I was wanting, wondering what kind of sign should we ask for instead of putting a fleece out? Well, I like to, I like to, whatever plan I'm going to do, I pray about it and I put, I really go for it. If it doesn't work out, God doesn't particularly appreciate quitters. So look what went wrong and pray about it. That's like putting a fleece out and try it again. If it doesn't work that time, then it might be time for you to say, okay, Lord, I've got the, I got the message. Now, which direction do I go? And you always take your alternate. The course and try that. Don't, but don't quit. That's the main thing. Uh, God always lets you know if, 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 if He wants you to succeed in something, you will succeed. But don't be a quitter. There's always a way. Um, I, I don't want to read a name here and you'll understand why. If I want to expel the evil spirits of drugs and alcohol from my son, do I anoint him with oil and command them to leave in the name of Jesus Christ? And does it matter if he fully believes or is or is it enough that I believe? Is it possible that it would need to be done more than once? Well, if he invites them back in after you cleanse him, yes, it should be done more than once. But um, 
it, it is it is Christ that has the ability to cleanse and he has given you power over all of your enemies in Christ's name. Um, so if the Son allows and requests that you anoint him, then anoint him with the oil of our people and order anything negative out. All right? And um, it... Um, uh, look him straight in the eye. Do not let him move his eyes away from you. It doesn't... Your belief is intercessory. And Father will let you know. Maud from Nevada... Cain and Abel, twins, where in the Bible? Where in the Bible does it say Cain and Abel are twins? Well, it's simply, uh, you you have to understand our Father's Word. And in chapter 4, verse 1, it stipulates that Adam knew his wife. Uh, Chapter 3, verses 15 and 16, it already transpired, and she gave birth to Cain. And, of course, Adam had her too. And verse 2 says, not again, but she continued in birth and gave birth to Abel. Now, if a woman has birthed one child and continues in labor and births another, they're twins. The Bible says it. It is true. You have to go to the Hebrew and uh, with understanding. All right. Hey, I'm out of time again. I love you all because you enjoy studying our Father's Word, but most of all, God loves you for it. It's the letter He has sent to you, whereby you're not deceived, especially in this generation, the generation which in most likely false Christ will come, and many already in the world. See that you're not deceived. You've got that unction. But it makes the Father's day, and when you make His day, boy, is He going to make yours, okay? That's great. We are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Once you do that, you bless God. He will always bless you. But you know what's most important? It's this. You stay in His Word. Every day in His Word is a good day, even with trouble. You know why? Because Jesus, Yeshua, He is the living Word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas. 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program and God bless you. Genesis 146, the first six chapters in God's Word. The world that was. Did you realize there was a world age before this one? Same old world, different age. The creation itself. When were the races created? You see, all the races were created separately, and you'll find that documented in these particular tapes. How was the, what? How and what was the sin in the garden? It will be discussed in this series also. This is a must for the serious Bible scholar, for if you do not understand how it was in the beginning, you certainly will never understand the end. I think you will find this series very rewarding and certainly will answer questions that no doubt you've always wondered about. Genesis 146. Hey, I know you're going to enjoy this series. Thank you.
Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Hey, welcome to this family Bible study hour. Let's complete the subject on familiar spirits. Now, uh, and this and the um, great story of the witch of Endor. Endor. What what is a witch? Well, let's recap just a little bit. The it is in the manuscripts called those that deal with familiar spirits. 